Yeah, thank you very much. Um, my name is Barbara, and uh, together with Michael, we will moderate the first hour with the panelists. And I'm happy to welcome you all to the sixth event of the Lanaka Conference, where we want to deal with pandemics and meta crisis. And before we dive into today's topic and present our panelists to you, I would like to give a short introduction to the Lanaka Conferences itself. It all started in 2018 when Gita Pine's idea was to bring people from all over the world together with different cultural and educational background to discuss the burning issues of our time and furthermore to find actionable ways to tackle them. And this event has been developed over the years and today we find ourselves in a series of conferences on meter crisis and urgent challenges of our world. Of challenges we have to solve together in a connected and collaborative way. Thus, all of us will generate and be part of a global social sculpture. Now this term dates back to the late Joseph Beuys, a famous German action artist, and it means that we all create and shape society together. So a so social sculpture. And to support this idea and to support you and the panelists and the participants in building this social sculpture, we prepared a padlet where we invite you to place a short description of yourself and your possible contribution to our topics. And the Padlet link will be in the chat room here. So when you open the chat, you can see the link to the Padlet, but you will also have find the link to the Padlet in the backstage area. And it would be lovely for everybody who joins. I think the speakers already, the panelists already are on, the moderators as well, but all the rest of you who are listening and watching uh, please join us there as well. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. I will post the link in the chat after my brief introduction on how to Larnaca. I only have two arms and one head and two monitors, so I will uh, do this first. Um, yeah, during this session, and uh, our panel of experts is here to share their viewpoints on the matter and react to the keynote. We also employ a separate chat, Barbara has already mentioned that, which is moderated by our chat expert and our online expert. It serves to pool questions and to help us to detect blind spots in the conversation. Where possible, we will invite questions or insights from the chat. Backstage, uh, backstage breakout sessions hosted by our panelists will enable discussion and involvement during the second and third hour of each conference, and they will take place after this main session. All of our findings will be published at Karl Auer Verlag. And of course, our hashtag Larnaca conferences can be used across all social networks to foster the growth of our social sculpture. Come and connect with us and others on social media as well. Now it's time to welcome our panelists and hear their thoughts on today's topic, pandemics and meta crisis. We will introduce each panelist shortly and hear the 10 minute maximum time statement directly after each introduction. Closing, we hope he will uh, join us with our keynote speaker, Dr. Malas. Barbara. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Michael. So if we just uh, stop the screen yeah. and so we can see each other. One moment, please. No. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Welcome. I would like to give a short summary sort of to reconnect you to the keynote with Dr. Malas. And uh, in this keynote, um, you, Mario, uh, Marius was interviewing Dr. Malas and uh, you tackled the gap between the scientific medical research on the one hand on health issues and on the other hand, politics, social media so and life itself. 
And what you decided was that you need medical knowledge and economic knowledge to design a health system. So it's really because we are uh, going into an age of a growing complexity and we need deeper understanding of the recent research and we have a lot to learn yet. So it's not enough to have just managerial knowledge. And this is sort of a very important message to, to politics in, in many ways, that the need, deeper knowledge is necessary. And also do tackle the, uh, the thing that the insecurities we have in, the, in our societies and uh, deepened by social media prevent us really from listening and being able to understand and grasp the enormous changes of our worldviews through the genetic and stem cell research, because in the last years, so many things have happened and we still really can't follow easily enough. And what I really liked was the uh, Dr. Malus decided a talk that he was fascinated by at the end of the talk. He said, we go into a future with less working people, more machines, cheaper products, poorer people, and machines that need material we run out of. This is the past that cannot work. And this sort of that we really put it to the point and say, okay, we have to rethink a lot. <clears throat> so, and with this, I'm um, I'm leading on to to you, Marius. And uh, it's okay if I say Marius. Yeah, this is my name. Yes. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, it's just uh, not Dr. Curiasis or, but I would like to introduce you shortly because um, you are a medical doctor. You are an internationally renowned and honored longevity researcher, and you are especially caring for the elderly people. You are the scientific director of the National Gerontology Center in Cyprus. And you recently published a study on which is how the pandemic affects elderly people. <laughs> and you uh, you shared a fun fact. And uh, I would cite this. You said, I enjoy a long day filled with clinical medical work and academic writing and research. But one thing I would love to do, brackets, and I haven't said it to anybody until today, is to work as a waiter. <laughs> okay, we can arrange that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Marius, we would like to uh, to have you as the first panel speaker to state uh, or give comments on the interview that you did with Dr. Malos. Yes, yeah, starting with the last item, the waiter bit. Um, it may seem funny, but I think it's a way to get in touch with people, see what they think. You discover many things if you see people relaxing and uh, waiting to be served. And you can get conversations that may lead to many different outcomes. So it's not, I don't know, I haven't analyzed this wish, um, but I think it has more than uh, meets the eye. Uh, but anyway, yes, uh, I'm a um, gerontologist, which means that I have an interest in all aspects of aging, including biological aspects, but also clinical and some, uh, some others like psycholo psychology for uh, all the people, um, some political matters, financial and so on. But I'm concentrating mainly on the medical matters. Um, this is in, in the field is called um, geriatrics. In other words, be a doctor for all the people and dealing okay. with illnesses, not necessarily with preventing illnesses, but dealing with, uh, with the medical aspects of it. Whereas gerontology in a wider term is preventing aging and preventing uh, illnesses as well, um, among, other, among other things. Um, I'm actually from Larnaca, and that's where the first uh, meeting was held in Larnaca, in my medical museum. I have a medical museum as well, which shows, uh, maybe I'll explain the rationale behind it. Um, 
And the idea of GitHub to, to promote this and expand it and make it a more regular event, it was a brilliant idea and I didn't expect that it would happen. Um, but um, I, I think it's going to be very helpful for everybody involved. And even if we achieve 1% of what we aim to achieve, I think this is better than, than doing nothing. Uh, one thing that people say is that, okay, you are interested in aging and that's a limited, relatively limited subject. It, it is not a limited subject because aging it means the way the human, the human being is um, affected by the passage of time. Um, we have interest in um, not only on illnesses and biological matters, but also on nature how nature affects the human body, um, how the environment has a contribution of this. So we have issues with the environment. Um, if we have wars, that means that we may be killed. Therefore, we're not going to live longer. So conflict resolution is, a, is an area as well. Financial, if we are poor and we don't have good health um, facilities, that means, again, we're not going to live longer and we're going to have illnesses. So financial aspects, um, the way the country is run uh, is relevant. And we can discuss these uh, areas in some more detail uh, soon. Uh, one thing that I'm particularly interested in is uh, how technology affects the human body. So now with the progress of technology and particularly digital communication technology. There is spread of ideas, easier, uh, there, are, there are easier ways of uh, accessing uh, information and material which would be very relevant to us, how we can deal with that material and improve the life of others as well, or the thinking process of others. Um, and the fact that we had the COVID pandemic, although it's tragic in many ways, one positive thing is that it, it accelerated the bond between humans and communication technology. Because we are um, isolated at home, at least initially, and the only way to communicate was through internet, through, through digital communication technology. And we have many older people who would not otherwise use technology. Now they are forced to use it. Um, our ministers here in Cyprus are thinking of ways to teach older people how to use technology. And this is one step towards global, um, let's say, the creation, the creation of a global super organism, all humans are connected together through technology, more or less instantly. And the, um, uh, we, we get humanity one step higher. We are becoming ourselves, the cell, the individual cell, the individual neuron in a global brain, in, a, in, a, in, a all, in, in all the people in the world connected together and interacting just like the, the neuron cells in the brain. And this has uh, many details to be discussed. The, the other thing that I'm interested in is complexity, how to increase complexity because with aging, we did some research many years ago, we found that that with the passage of time, complexity in, in the human body is reducing. Uh, and this may be the reason why we have so many uh, illnesses and dysfunction of the body, because it's not complex enough. So if we increase this uh, complexity with different ways, we get a state of better, better function and better health. And this is not only at the level of, of the individual, but um, at the level of the whole planet. Hopefully everybody would uh, benefit from this. Um, I think I'll leave it at that and we can discuss the different details as we go along um, and give the chance to somebody else to say a few things. Thank you, Thank you very much, Marius. Uh, we decided that we go 
in an alphabetical order for the panelists. And so the next one would be Gitta then. Uh, except, except we, uh, uh, Mark Damon Harvey is here as a panelist too. Then, ah, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, Mark. Okay. Then it's Mark yeah. Harvey. So you got know. out of it, Gita. <laughs> <laughs> got me. <laughs> um. But Harvey, I'm I'm not sure that I'm prepared to introduce you. Could you please introduce yourself? Oh no. Um. <laughs> okay, I can do it. Aha, <laughs> um, uh -huh, that would be good. <laughs> okay, I can try. <laughs> um, uh, I I do not know Mark Damon Harvey so long for a long time, but uh, the few exchanges we had, I learned that Mark, you are an expert not only in racism and um, prejudice and how to avoid them, but um, you bring the problems of today to the point from a global perspective. And I find this very helpful. As I learned, you have experience also as a teacher, yeah, which uh, is very needed today because I think everybody should teach <laughs> always <laughs> what he or she knows. Um, you are from, uh, uh, from Switzerland, right? And you live, I do not live, know where you exactly live. In Zurich. In Zurich. Okay, thank you. Is there anything you would like to add? For example, what is your favorite meal or something like that? Um, well, um, I remembered that you asked for a fun fact, so I just yeah. remembered something. Um, when I was a child, uh, my mother's, my father's, my grandfather's name was Richard, and uh, Uh, he wanted to have a son very badly, and he had two daughters. And so um, <clears throat> he just decided that he would give uh, one of his daughters uh, the same name that he had. So my mother's name is Richard. <laughs> and, and so it took, it took me, I had to become 10 years old before I realized that Richard wasn't a girl's name. So that was that was kind of a strange uh, example when we used to go to places and she had to give her name somewhere. Then someone was always saying, yeah, OK, Richie, you mean Richie or something like that? And she said, no, it's Richard. And so um, I think that's interesting. Absolutely. Um, I love it, especially because you always have your finger on the pulse of equity and equality. Yeah, yeah, and so it was a it was an early experience. Yeah. Um, the the other things that are probably important about me is that I mean, <clears throat> I studied economics originally, and then I uh, went through an MBA program, one of the first ones that that existed in the U.S. No one knew what an MBA was then in the U.S. And then I came to Switzerland, and then they thought I must be, I don't know. <laughs> At any rate, I decided that the, the only thing I could do was actually um, find out what else I could do to, to uh, earn money. And so then I went into an internal company uh, IT program and became a programmer analyst. Um, at the peak of the IT optimism that existed at those uh, during that time when um, shortly thereafter, I became one of the first PC teachers in in Switzerland. And I remember the optimism there that's uh, um, bordering on the same that we have now as far as uh, artificial intelligence is concerned, where people were saying, well, you know, with the computers, it's great because we'll have to work less and um, everyone will be able to switch over and become a programmer analyst And it should be no problem. It's just a bright future. And as an economist, I thought it was uh, hilarious. I mean, yeah. um, I mean, it's streamlining um, processes using the computer is not going to make it possible for a factory worker to learn how to program. And um, so there you go. But AI is doing um, something similar right now. Um, I think that... Uh, Science is all well and good. I, it's been uh, focused on so much that is uh, monodisciplinary. I think it's um, that makes sense as a way to start off. But in the end, uh, we we notice as far as the 
complexity is concerned or the bifurcation is concerned that um, <clears throat> connections are more important than anything else. Connecting between the disciplines is, is the only way we'll be able to deal with the, um, with the, the combinations that, that we're seeing. Um, I think that science existing on its own or a particular discipline existing on its own is not particularly scientific <laughs> because uh, science is going to be something or should be something that is um, superordinated and should include all sorts of sciences, uh, including the metaphysics that has been ignored also within the European um, scientific discipline. So um, for me, interdisciplinary uh, attitudes, that's the only thing that's going to get us out of this hellhole that we've put together. Um, the other thing is that the science has become, of course, very endearing to the, um, to the economic part of society. That is, um, science is driven by money, of course. And in the old days, old, old days, uh, people were um, trying to find out something because they were very curious, or it was maybe perhaps um, a job that was given to them to research. So I think that science is backing itself into a corner uh, by being uh, monodisciplinary. Um, it, as soon as you start talking about interdisciplinary aspects of science and people start, start smiling and saying, well, we don't do that. And that's interesting, especially if you go towards metaphysics. Um, so um, it has to spread out that there have to be, we'll have to have some, some better connections. Actually, that would be good for uh, a good aspect for AI because it can figure out um, by weighting different aspects of different sciences in which direction we can go. Um, the other thing that's interesting to me is um, knowledge production um, as far as coming from indigenous cultures and um, other cultures that are not included in what we call science, which is, of course, Eurocentric. If uh, we are going to solve the world's problems, we're going to have people, we're going to have other people from other parts of the world involved and not as um, an afterthought. That is that the Europeans or the Americans set up some sort of system or project. And then afterwards they ask the other people on this planet what they think about it. Um, it would be better for me just to start with the other people on the planet, especially the indigenous cultures, the ones that have been dealing with um, conflict situations and were able to live more in harmony with the ecological system that is fading away now, to ask them what they think first before we decide um, what, what the way forward could be. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Mark. Um, Barbara and Michael uh, and everybody, I just got a uh, note uh, <coughs> from uh, Dr. Malas. Um, he wrote, dear all, I'm in hospital for an emergency of a close friend. Sincere apologies, Stavros. Oh. Yeah, yeah. so um, all our thoughts are with him. Yeah, I will, I will answer him later. And um, I think it's in all of your interest that I... Send greetings from, from everybody. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, this is completely understandable, and I find this very uh, kind of him to uh, send us note. this mail, even in this situation. Yes, that's just not something everybody does. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mark Harvey. And now I'm alphabetically leading. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Try again, leading over to Gita. <laughs> And I proudly present Gita Pine as the initiator and host of the Lanaka conferences. And Gita Pine is an economist and founder and director of Form World Institute, initiator of Lanaka conferences, co inventor of Form World and Weltform, systems researcher, cyberneticist. Didn't know this word before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so many, many heads and closely interconnecting things. Gita gave a fun fact uh, also, and she loves marzipan. 
and swimming and can talk for hours about language, clarity and complexity management until all listeners thinking marbles are smoking properly from all the spinning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> Uh, first of all, um, I would like to thank all participants for being here today. The Lanaka conferences are special to me because our focus is less on saying smart things and more on how we actually implement those smart things. For that, we need everyone's help and we need to rethink grassroots movements and how to rebuild the United Nations from the bottom up, so to speak, and to do it in such a way that good projects come out of it. I am enthusiastic about the fact that some projects have already emerged in the last conferences. For example, we will help starving children in Kenya and support women in making an even more effective contribution to social development. Today, of course, is about the remarkable keynote by Dr. Stavros Malas and Dr. Marius Kuriazis. I'm so sorry, Marius. <laughs> Marius Kuriazis who inspired me to think about meta crisis and complexity management with uh, their thoughts on fractured equilibrium and how they compare societal developments to systemic phenomena in the body. Thank you for that, both of you. I first encountered the term meta crisis in an interview with education expert Thomas Björkman, and I wondered how useful it might be for us to grasp what, what is actually happening here right now globally. I understand it to mean a crisis that spills over into several systems at once, or rather that is dealt with differently in different systems, such as economy, art, science, but of course also in psyches, bodies, and motivates different reactions and solutions there. We cannot predict what will play out as a, as a meta crisis because we know from systems research that complex systems like societies function similarly to chaotic systems where the butterfly strike in Tokyo can at least hypothetically trigger a hurricane in Idaho. In globalization, however, we must assume that there will be more and more global meta crises because we are complexly interconnected, which is why how we think here in Germany, for example, has an impact on the health of the children in Kenya. What we put in our shopping carts and how we deal with the pandemic no longer just have consequences for ourselves, but global effects that we often cannot even assess at first. That in mind, it should become clear to everyone that there is a meta crisis that dominates all other meta crises, namely a meta crisis of consciousness or rather of our communication and action systems. If we, looked, uh, if we look at the polarized dispute about COVID-19 in the social media, we see that it is devouring enormous energies and is being conducted at a level that can hardly contribute to actually solving the problems. In fact, such conflicts are always heading towards even more extreme outcomes. And it is not unlikely that more governments will start thinking about introducing mandatory vaccination as a result of subsequent socially deficient structures below, as are, for example, first few, I'm sorry, few citizens are even prepared by their education to deal with such complexities. Second, even in the richer countries, the social foundations are anything but suitable for to give rise to people who can participate in society without fear. And third, there are, there are a lot of consequential problems as well as further meta crises like worldwide poverty and opportunistic solution programs like development aid, whose dubious results we see everywhere. Whoever goes out into the world as a complexity conscious person who can highly dimension and highly differentiate in order to present his or her ideas on the challenges of today experiences again and again that a large part of what he or she thinks cannot be reflected on socially in large parts. For systems researchers, 
Public dialogue is a constant challenge to find ways to avoid being poured through a very narrow sieve because they know that the problems, problems simply cannot be grasped at uh, low levels of complexity. And the less of their language they get socially implemented, that is, the less of it is actually communicated further, the less of their so solutions are understood. In democracies, this means they cannot be implemented. We simply cannot cram a multi-dimensional pig through a one-dimensional slot. <laughs> as long as that is our problem, we will have to rely on solutions from above over the heads of the population. And that cannot be a solution in the long run. From this, we know that it is then only a question of time until the ideological impulses in the population are taken over by totalitarian thinking opportunists and the consequences are exclusion, wars, and further misery. Especially here and now, when the climate crisis, with all its associated catastrophes, is not only on our doorstep, but has long since crossed the threshold in many parts of the world, we need to rethink education, because we will not be able to solve the coming problems with societies whose citizens are in many cases incapable of multidimensional and complexity aware thinking. What does this mean? What is thought? can only be made accessible to a small part of the population. The vast majority of the rest find it enormously difficult to grasp even a fraction of it. Why? Because systemic problems can only be grasped with systemic symbol sets via systemic language and systemic concepts. And most people know next to nothing about this and therefore cannot follow. Even worse, many do not know how to put in words what is happening out there in meta crises everywhere and with them in such a way that descriptions emerge which depict the complexity. Of course, they are then also quick victims, <laughs> victims of ideologues who float on the global polarization like oil on water and thus prevent any deeper discussion and thus instrumentalize frightened citizens and crises like today's pandemic for their own purposes. What is needed is not only clear and complexity aware communication on the part of social leaders from politics, science, art, media and business, but also intensive programs to enable the world's population to grasp the phenomena mentally and communicatively, and also intensive economic support programs to ensure while still in need that citizens are safe and can therefore deal with the crises in a more relaxed manner. We urgently need to work on programs like socially unlock the innate complexity management skills in all people so that everyone can engage constructively and creatively. Healthy systems operate in such a way that they have full access to their evolutionary assets. And in terms of that, we are still far behind in many ways. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gitta. Last but not least, a warm welcome to Ilya Stambler, PhD from Israel. Um, I, I give a, a short introduction. He is a systemic researcher of longevity and chairman of the Israeli Longevity Alliance. And he's also in the uh, in the head of uh, multiple organizations. Um, what I found very fascinating is that his research is focused on historical and sociological implications of life of aging and life extension. Um, I still have no fun fact, but uh, I, I'd like to say um, that our mail exchange uh, before this uh, panel was very poignant, focused and friendly. Uh, I enjoyed it very much. And uh, maybe you can add a little fun fact about yourself. We have a, a grandma named Richard. We have a waiter uh, turned doctor. Uh, what, what have you in, uh, in, in store for us? Well, uh... Not a lot. I'm no fun at all. So, <laughs> I'll just, That's a lie. <laughs> I'll just go directly, directly to the point. 
Um, yes, thank you. Thank you very much for this introduction. And uh, thank you, Vigita, for inviting uh, me and uh, for, for everybody on this panel to, to participate in this um, uh, discussion. Uh, I would like to um, uh, build my response mainly on what uh, Dr. Malas said uh, regarding the distribution of uh, society's research resources. Uh, mainly, he mentioned that if a society um, directed more resources to science, to scientific research, specifically medical research, perhaps less to, to military, perhaps he wouldn't be in this crisis. And, and that's something that uh, appealed to me a lot and that I would, uh, would want to, to develop. And, and more specifically, um, as mentioned, I'm a longevity researcher. Uh, and more exactly, I'm, I'm a combination of longevity researcher and advocate. I did some research, I have two books and, and uh, some articles. Uh, that's my book, uh, longevity, Promo longevity Promotion, Multidisciplinary Perspectives. Uh, but I'm also an advocate. I'm an activist. I run uh, NGOs uh, that uh, specifically promote aging research. And that's my agenda to, to have uh, more funds, uh, more resources directed to aging research. And why? I believe if we re did uh, invest more, uh, more resources to aging, to aging research, we wouldn't be in this crisis. It is very obvious that um, uh, this crisis mostly affects all the people. Uh, mostly affects the health. It's uh, not just a question of a virus attacking people. It's a question, a question of uh, virus attacking multimorbid pe people. So uh, you really need to consider it in a complex uh, of a virus plus uh, the age-related multimorbidity. And people simply don't get it. Uh, I spent most part of the last year uh, trying to uh, explain this connection. We organized international conferences online on the connection of aging and immunity. And uh, we, we wrote position papers with leading scientists. We, we addressed the press. We went to the government. Uh, people are not getting this connection. Uh, they think the virus is some, uh, some a mental compartment and the age-related risk factors are another a mental compartment. They, they, they don't mix. Uh, and that's a big problem uh, because if we're able to, to address the age-related risk factors, we'll also be able to uh, fight successfully this pandemic and this crisis and also prevent uh, perhaps all future crises. And that's not just medical crisis, that's also economic crisis. We're obviously going into recession big time and the older people will be most vulnerable. Uh, we're obviously going into ecological crisis and the older people will be most vulnerable. So if we really want to address uh, also these types of crises and these types of challenges, we need to improve the health of all the people. We need to invest more in aging research. That's been our agenda uh, um, before the pandemic. I've been in this activism for 20 years. In 2002, we started our first uh, website um, on this issue, and it's going to be valid uh, also during this pandemic and after this pandemic, because aging is not going anywhere. It will remain the main uh, risk factor for all future crises. Uh, so um, I would like to, to head my, my um, responses. Uh, health and longevity promotion is a universal preventive measure against future crises. And uh, I believe it's, it's really valid because uh, we need to understand what is actually crisis, the very definition of a crisis, even in medicine. Crisis is basically a state of helplessness. Uh, you can ask Marius, uh, what's a crisis in, uh, uh, of a sick person that, that's, uh, that's, you know, you can't do anything to him. He's, he's, he or she is in a crisis. You, you, it's, he's either survives or, uh, you know, um, or, or not. Uh, it's very difficult to intervene. So this, uh, uh, this approach is, is profoundly anti-crisis. So basically we want prevention. Uh, we, we want to avoid the state of helplessness. Uh, and another point, why, why actually we do we need uh, to focus on aging research? Uh, also because of the issues you get mentioned, uh, the, the systemic thinking, the multidisciplinary thinking, uh, you cannot do aging research without considering all the assets. You know, some people try to focus on molecules, uh, but if you really do aging research, you have to uh, consider everything from molecules to the environment, to cosmos, you really have to be a holist to, to study aging. And also it's, it's a long-term thinking. It's really a, a, a preventive thinking. It's, it's a thinking for the long-term that the many people lack. And it's probably one of the reasons we we're in this mess right now. So um, uh, I just want to, to use this opportunity to again advance our agenda of, of more aging research and, and hopefully uh, through, through this kind of gatherings as well. Wow. Thank you, Ilya. I totally uh, resonated with your uh, crisis is a state of helplessness that touched me. Yeah, this is exactly what, what is happening when uh, you are in a crisis. Wow, love it. Yeah, so uh, Barbara, Michael, we have uh, three 
approaches on the same topic with uh, one uh, uh, party says it's uh, um, looking at the elder people because as Ilya um, put it, um, pandem pandemic always attacks especially elder people in crisis the same. And uh, Mark who said uh, that interdisciplinarity is the key and I'm saying that systemic thinking uh, for everybody is the key, but in, in when we put it together, we all say practically the same. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, uh, aging seems to be a topic that needs to be approached holistically, so it is really inter intersectional, and uh, uh, so there's an area where it seems to work. Yeah. I think since we have uh, 15 minutes left for the panel to discuss uh, before the participants come in, uh, first thing, I, I think it might be really a good idea if we stay together and uh, invite the panelists. So we have only one breakout session and uh, uh, all pan panelists come here. Or how shall we do this? Um, Michael and Barbara, we can use one breakout session and everybody meets there. I would su suggest we okay. uh, take breakout room one. Yes, okay, and, and, there. and you inform all other participants who want yeah. to go to breakout rooms through, through, uh, too that we meet here. The other thing is, I think um, if it's okay with you, Mark, um, a good idea for Ilya and Marios, uh, first to line out some um, aspects, how um, COVID-19 and from their perspective, even all crises first attack the elder people. How is this interconnected? And Ilya, you said uh, you sounded a little bit frustrated about to how many people you have talked, and there's less, uh, far less effect than you uh, wanted to have. Mark, are you okay with this that we concentrate first on them? Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Let the two of you start, and uh, all of us can uh, keep our mic open and have a vivid discussion if something is uh, coming up we find interesting to say something to. Okay. Yeah. 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 I, I would like I would like to say something when we talk about aging is not. Uh, necessarily a bad thing. What we should concentrate on is the dysfunction that comes with aging, because um, yeah. all the people can be perfectly healthy and uh, deal with whatever uh, infection or whatever crisis <coughs> um, uh, falls to them. Mm -hmm. But um, we are dealing with the dysfunction of aging in the sense that we the, the person is not able to meet the challenge that is in front of them. Mm -hmm. So if, if they are unable to meet this challenge, then there is a crisis and we have to find out why and probably uh, personalize this to the individual person, not sage only generally. Generalities help as well. Um, for example, what Ilya said, that there should be more research into aging, which would mean that uh, we deal with the dysfunctions of aging, therefore pandemics like this one won't be so uh, important for the people because they will be able to adapt to the challenge and deal with it. Um, so I would like to, I, I wanted to make this distinction between aging in general and dysfunction associated with aging. Yeah, so you would say that, uh, for example, when an uh, elder uh, person cannot work with Zoom or other modern technology, this is part of the problem. And not only that um, pr the lungs do not work properly or something like that. Yes, we are becoming mm. uh, half human and half machine. We should not only look after the body, but look also after the technology surrounding the body. Mm. Um, we should teach people who don't know how to use technology to use it efficiently and enhance themselves. Mm. Um, that's what I've been saying for some time now, that our environment is not necessarily trees and birds and 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 mountains our environment is only two aspects human and machines in most developed countries mm. so we should concentrate on that relationship i'd rather not <laughs> um actually um I, I think the most 
the interesting thing that I heard from Elias was in particular about the comorbidity. I think that's um, that's definitely a connection point between different crises that we have that, um, um, for instance, if there was, uh, if it was possible to find out uh, what uh, the connection is between um, um, so-called, um, what's it called, standard American diet, uh, SAD, and uh, comorbidities and aspects of uh, susceptibility to COVID. Um, these are the things that I'm really interested in because of the food industrial complex um, is just churning out stuff unchecked and um, people are just buying it and no one ever talks about the prevention side of all of these problems. And that's where I see a direct connection to what uh, the two of you have said now, uh, Marius and Ilya, um, that, that if we could reach a point where we aren't constantly relying on the pharmaceutical side of um, dealing with the symptoms and could actually take prevention seriously, that is, uh, that is responsible uh, food production and things like that, that would change the whole scenario also. Um, of course, food is only part of it. The other thing that I'm interested in is, uh, uh, like you said, Mars, the idea of uh, um, um, post-humanism um, that is uh, uh, becoming, uh, well, the beginning of, of cyborg um, uh, constellations. If I could be optimistic about it, then I would say, okay, great, um, it's a natural step in our evolution, but I see the human psyche is not being up to it at all. Um, that is, uh, as they have often said before, uh, putting uh, atomic weapons into the hands of children. Um, if we could reach some sort of uh, psychological evolution that is maturity, uh, where we don't act out um, as children, then I could somehow relate to the idea of becoming, of the man-machine interface being smaller and smaller. That's what I think. <laughs> okay, thank you. We still have, we have uh, two people here on the screen that have not shown up yet, but uh, we can always already see them. That's Hans Kluge and Patrick Kappler. And they were in the chat in the background. And could you just come in and show yourselves? And okay. Uh, Good evening, everybody. Hello, Hello Patrick. Hi. Hello, Patrick. Hello, Hans. So you were in the background and uh, you had a look at the chat, right? Yeah, definitely. Yes, and I, I, I got two questions. So if you're ready, I, I would like to read them. And one is uh, for Gitta from Sabina Born. In the context of the need of hand and complexity, are there ideas of introducing form wealth to teenager schools, especially in Germany? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, we have uh, three pilot projects, one in Germany, one in India, and one in Kenya we will start with. And at the moment, Formal Online is there. We will um, go from school to school. We will make it public that uh, the service is available and children can work with it. We have a translation of Formal into icon based Formal so that uh, children who cannot read or write <clears throat> and adults who cannot read or write also can participate so nobody is excluded. Um, and in the long run, we will also create um, FormWelt as uh, um, an audio concept and as a visual, uh, in visual translations, in sound and whatever, so everybody can work with FormWelt. And even we are thinking about creating FormWelt as virtual reality language, so you can create meaning with landscape. Thank you, Gita. And I have another question from Andreas Schwitzer. Shouldn't personal crisis as well as meta crisis also be seen as opportunities or in other words, without crisis, deficit, changes, attitude, etc., 
are not noticed? Are crises then not even necessary for the further development of a society in this sense? It's a long question. Can crisis be seen as a positive stimulus that, if possible, leads uh, to new thinking? And I think that's a question for all of you. Pame? Yeah, Ilya, yeah. please. Yes, I think we need to distinguish between the crisis and the challenge. You know, as we defined crisis, really is a state of helplessness, really something we, we don't want to be, um, and we have to prevent. But challenges are fine. You know, we, we develop thanks to challenges. So, so definitely we, we need to see the problems and we need to address them to, to prevent them if possible. But crisis is something we definitely don't want to, to be in. With one sentence, you uh, uh, made a sh uh, you you shut down the whole esoteric discussion on crisis and challenges. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I so, agree with that as well because uh, uh, the point is for the individual to be able to overcome the obstacle in front of them. In a crisis, by definition, they are mostly unable to overcome it. Therefore, it's not a good thing. Is, is like uh, the comparison with this, with stress. We have positive stress and negative stress. Uh, positive stress keeps the brain <clears throat> and the body stimulated and it's, it's good for us. The excessive stress, which is negative stress, is not good for anything. It's the opposite. Um, uh, uh, I'm not sure whether, do we really need the definitions right now, or wouldn't it be better to find out what the crises are? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's helpful to distinguish between uh, challenge and crisis as Ilya and Mario did, because oh, yeah. I often seen that especially people who know next to nothing about crisis are talking about crisis as if it uh, would be a good thing, and uh, everybody who once in his or her life has experienced crisis, no, it is not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I think this, this is uh, really helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay, Patrick, Hans, that's all from the chat so far? Yeah, okay. so far it is all. Thank you Thank for you. answering the questions. Thank you too.